Available to you. Sign right. up for DB Groundwork. <laughs> the links are live on our Facebook. <laughs> I'll get to it, put it in the Facebook event right after this. <laughs> oh, oh, it took us uh, all of two weeks to get everything ready for you. Oh, 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 I feel so much pressure on me right now. It's like right here on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Myron. Hello and welcome to Long Winded Wednesday, where we get really long winded about topics we like to discuss that pertain to building bridges. Uh, Myron and I are both facilitators, so we rarely get to participate. So that's what we're going to do today, focusing on privilege and oppression through the lens of racial equity. Mm. Hey, that's also the topic that we will be focusing on our Building Bridges Groundwork Sessions. Burr, burr, burr. Now available to register for. The first one is on June 18th. So we have a capacity of 25 people for the white individual session and the BIPOC session registered now if you're interested to save your spot we have some other dates throughout the summer mm -hmm. yeah exciting we have lots of different dates available and the intention is yeah that you would only come to one but if you want to come to more you can but um it is uh, the idea is that we've we've great we've laid a ground we've laid a path for you to join into our bb community and to deepen in this work and so step one would be to be in a groundwork sec session, and then there will be more opportunities down the line to deepen that engagement and deepen your learning and experience with us. Yes, so uh, check out our, our Facebook page for those links. I can also add those links here probably. Whew. I feel uh, more nervous about today's. I think we need to do some grounding for us. Yeah. What is up? I mean, I know there's a lot up, but yeah. I feel like it's always like, oh, it's 12.30, let's get on here. But today it feels extra ah! <laughs> on my end. So do you want to lead us through a grounding thing? Yeah, just waiting for you. Are you done? putting your links in. Well, that's going to take me a little while. So <laughs> this first. Okay. Uh, first, let's just take a breath. Breath is always a good place to start. So breathe in and out. And Kind of like what we did last time this time when at the top we're going to hold it a little bit and then if you want to let noises or anything extra come out at the bottom go ahead and do that so we're going to breathe in hold two three four five and <sighs> let's do one more okay. and really just like Filling in the depths, like let your belly out, let your ribs out, really like fill in with air as much as you can and just get even more connected and focused on that area. And also just noticing um, our connection, like where are your feet, where's your body um, and just noticing that connection as well. So slowly breathing in. Hold, two, three, four, five, and yeah. 
I'm gonna stake it out too. Okay, now I'm gonna add the link. Um, okay. <laughs> Maren, how are you? How are you doing today? Um, I have a lot of nervous energy right now. Um, I'm all right though. I'm excited to, yeah, like you said, we've been working, we've been working slowly, like for three months to really kind of practice and pilot what we feel like we could offer in terms of support. And so it feels really exciting to, like we just went through this whole process of getting to where we are and having some like legit offerings uh, to move forward. And it feels really exciting, again, what what that means for the bigger picture of what, what we can do online as building bridges, as shift. Um, and yeah, also it's me and Jenny on shift and we're, we're trying to do all the things and support folks who also are coming in and, try, and needing and wanting help now. And that feels big, exciting, but big. Yeah. How about you, where are you at? How do you feel? So oh, I'm trying to add this link, but maybe that's not as easy as I thought. Okay. Well, it's on our Facebook. Yeah, so that's fine. It'll be in the uh, events. I'm doing okay. I, I feel better today than I did uh, last week. Um, feeling more like um, head above water mm. versus last week I felt like kind of drowning and everything that was going on and uh, just um, the amount of work that we had cut out for us. So mm -hmm. now I feel excited because we actually have something in place for people to start uh, coming, coming to and signing into. Yeah. How is everyone out there? <laughs> yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> hey, folks. Would you like to comment how you are? Let's see if I can, uh, this will mute. Is that Hamida? Hamida? <laughs> are you watching? Is that what I see? How are you, Hamida? Oh, I see Jennifer has commented, still not captioned. Hello, oh, Jennifer. Shoot. Hi, Jennifer. My name is also yeah. Jennifer. I go by Jenny. <laughs> I want to let you know that we are working on getting the captions in order. We've come across some obstacles around getting the right software to make sure it's everything's getting captioned. We don't currently have the staff capacity to make sure everything is captioned, but thank you for reminding us and we are definitely working on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our topic for today is privilege and oppression through the lens of racial equity. So with our time together, we're gonna go uh, until 1.15 now and see how that feels. Um, but Maren, I really wanted to just dive into so the topic that we would be addressing in our sessions. We're not mm -hmm. going to go into it as deep, mm -hmm. but I think we both have done a lot of learning around privilege and op oppression and how that plays out for me as a woman of color, a Latina, for you as a white woman. So now, Maren, when I say privilege, what comes to mind? And how do you feel upon hearing that word? Um, I feel very neutral to the word. Like, yeah, privilege. I have privilege, um, not only white privilege, but I have privilege in, in various identities that I hold. Uh, and so what's over the last few years working with Building Bridges, whether it's been, been a participant or been facilitating, I've I've been learning and, and growing in, in understanding all the different aspects of that, that I am cisgendered, 
I'm heterosexual, that there are different identities that I that hold power or are seen as quote unquote the default. And um, I have operated most of my life in never having to, to really rectify or think about some of those identities in the ways that I'm learning that other folks have had to. So um, yeah, I'm just uh, also with other words, like for me, racism and to call myself racist doesn't feel charged. I feel like that is, I've gotten to a point of, yeah, I've been conditioned. I've been, I've been a part of, I've, I've, I've been taught in various ways, what is or isn't okay to say or do. And, um, it's my job as an adult human being to, to learn how that, um, plays out in my life and attempt to unlearn, attempt to, to peel off layers, to attempt to like actually see what is this facade of what I've been taught versus what is actually real and trying to figure out what that means for me in my life. Yeah. How about you? When I hear the word privilege now, now I can associate it more with myself I think uh, years ago, I would associate privilege to be synonymous with white privilege. Mm. And so I was like, yeah, I don't feel like I have that. But now after being in Building Bridges, with Building Bridges as a facilitator and on staff now for a couple of years, um, I think about all the privileges. I think about <clears throat> citizenship um, status privilege and sexual orientation privilege and class privilege and all these different privileges. So I feel like it's a weighted word mm -hmm. um, that now actually sometimes makes me uncomfortable in mm -hmm. thinking through that because I know the amount of compounded privilege that I do have right now. Yeah. And that's come up in some of our previous conversations, even specifically around COVID and how that's showing up. Yeah. Yeah. What about when you hear the word oppression? What do you think of? What feelings come up for you? Um, what do I think about the word oppression? Yeah, I think, I think it's a similar idea of like, it was this, this oppression happens out here. <laughs> that there's this, the system is oppressing and like, and that it's it's a it's the separated entity from me, and um, yeah, I think just coming into more neutrality or understanding of around what that means, and and getting to a point of um, knowing that I'm, I'm a part of that. Like, I'm not, that there's, I, there's that I play into that. And I, what my job is, is to continuously reflect on how I'm showing up and, 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 and depending on the identity that I hold or am holding and, um, what is coming up in the moment. So, um, that feels like a really big, heavy word, almost like, slaves and slavery and and versus enslaved like I don't know it just feels like it's this nubious thing that feels really untangible and so um I don't know if oppression yeah I think just like white supremacy can feel like it's this weird separate separate thing um I I'm just more and more coming to understand like yeah, again, how it shows up in, in me. It's not like I am a white person and I'm oppressive because I, I'm a part of the KKK or a part of kind of those out there things. I'm trying to consider just what are the words that I say, the actions that I take that may or may not um, show up in a microaggression or show up in a way that is still oppressive, but not again, in this big nubulous way. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So it sounds like oppression is a heavier word for you yeah. than privilege. Yeah, that's one still feels kind of like. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? How about you? When I, it's kind of the opposite for me. When right. I hear the word oppression, I'm like, 
Yeah, and what? <laughs> what else is new? What's new? What else is new under the sun? Um, and then like, yeah, I just feel like oppression is such a general term. Yeah. It's almost like lost its meaning outside of being attached to systemic oppression or like racial injustice or like what kind of oppression are we talking about here? Yeah. And I think even in hearing and watching some of the protests that happened earlier, not even earlier this year, a month ago, I don't even know, around like protesting the right to have a haircut and go to a restaurant. I remember seeing people being like, we are oppressed right so now. Oppressed. We have a stay at home order and it's taking away our civil rights. And I'm yeah. like, great, now that word's kind of like, out the window <laughs> but mm. um, yeah I think it's helpful in, in getting privilege and oppression are helpful terms and getting a group on the same page of what we're talking about yeah but I think that there's many other helpful words that we can start using um, that will get us clearer about what we're actually talking about mm. and what are those well, adding the word systemic feels like uh, helpful to me, systemic mm -hmm. oppression. I've really started calling out white supremacy above mm -hmm. anything else. Like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about white supremacy? Because that, <laughs> that's usually what we're talking about. Yeah, like, and that, <laughs> that is so entangled with uh, patriarchy. Yeah. Um, toxic masculinity, toxic... Uh, monogamy uh-oh mm -hmm. i throw that in there rout, rout. heteronormative ways like all these yeah. different things are really enwrapped with white supremacy and this need to to hoard power and tell people that there's only one right way and that we have to be a certain we have to achieve this level of whiteness mm -hmm. how would you define whiteness Woo! We're just going in. How would I define whiteness? Whiteness is, whiteness has been created. Whiteness is a culture. Whiteness is a conditioning and energy. Um, uh, yeah, that, that gives an outline, a checklist of what's what is right, what is wrong, how you're supposed to be, and if you're not this, if you deviate from this, if then, um, yikes! And that that in itself is kind of the playbook or the playlist for me to know that I get I get to I get to do things to you, or I get to um, say things, or create policies, or deny resources. Like there's um, it plays into this permission and an idea around who gets to be superior and who gets to have what. Um, whiteness also, I don't know, the more that I'm in this work, it feels easier to see. And you and I joke about it, like, it's like, oh my God, that's, that's some white stuff happening right there. That's, and so it's, it's, there's nuances to it as well uh, in terms of patterns and it's just and how people are how white folks interact how we talk what we deem as important or not important and oftentimes to me what feel you know this turns into like white fragility and white guilt is like it's more about this um it, inability to talk about race um because you haven't had to um, and so there's like this toddler, like, um, energy around it of like, uh, I'm just not used to or wanting to talk about race and what that actually means. Like, I don't, I'm not raced. I'm not a white person. What does that mean? Yeah. And I, I think. I come at it from a different perspective um, in terms of like I'm starting to see whiteness more and more as something that is truly unattainable and that mm. any person of any shade can tr can can try to attain 
yeah. and start to live out yeah. or yeah. start to live out white supremacy, whether or not they have been raced white or Caucasian. Mm. And I see it. And that's part of like the insidious nature of the thing of white right. supremacy is that we're all set up. We're all set up to fail in attaining whiteness. And yet we're living with this reality where we are living in a racialized society, which means yep. we've each been given a race. We're each required to check a census box with what race we are. And I say race in quotations because I think it's like contrary to popular belief of what what um, inclusion and equity facilitators might believe. Like, I don't believe we are born with the race. I don't believe, I believe we are the human race, but don't get it twisted that we're still living in a racialized society. And therefore we have to live with the repercussions of what it means day to day to be raced, black, brown, Latinx, white, Asian, and then also the repercussions of history We're not living outside of a historical narrative. Right. What do you think, why do you think there is more of what seems to be a reaction in the last couple of weeks because of that? Is there, there is just a missed historical context of it all? What kind of reaction are you talking about? I'm talking about after the murder of George Floyd and the protests and the and the rioting and the looting and just what like felt like what you and I have talked about of like and can call like the collective fuss like there's just was so much and specifically around white folks. Um, I'm just yeah I'm wondering what what your perspective is. Hmm. It, okay, so I, I will say it kind of feels like it almost, it's like when you understand music after studying it for a while, I've, I've been a musician, I would say, I guess, um, since I was a kid, I played the viola and now I play the guitar and I learned to understand music and the rhythms yeah, and the frequency of it, you yeah. know? And go like da -da 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 -da. and that's how I'm starting to see this conversation of race in the U.S. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's much different from what happened in 2014, 2015 around Black Lives Matter. It's just bigger, like a bigger arch. Mm. Like back then, it was like, no, let's not talk about it, and and I was personally affected by that because I was trying to get people to talk about racism, and at that time it was diversity. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, no, 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 we don't want to. And then there's this uh, national crisis and event. And then there was a spike in interest. And then it dwindled, you know? Mm -hmm. and so I, I, that's my perspective on it. It doesn't, again, doesn't feel new. No. Um, that people are jumping on the bandwagon. It's just happening in greater numbers. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Unprecedented. Never seen before. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And that also it's, it's um, in terms of the US, it makes sense that there's such a big jump to me, mm. given the rev up until now, mm -hmm. in 2016, when Trump was elected. Yeah. Now there have been multiple spikes. There's been the Muslim ban, like the, um, the travel ban and, um, and everything that's going on with detention centers and, mm -hmm. It's just, it's really, it feels kind of like a, an orchestra and this is the grand finale in mm. terms of how much our people are gonna take around white supremacy. Yeah. I'm really looking at it. Or how it's playing out in our current systems because it's been way worse in the past. Right, <laughs> right. You look back in history like, wow, the fact that I could even sit here and talk to you wouldn't have been possible right what are you noticing or or wondering around this time's reaction from the 
Yeah, I feel like that's partly what I've been, and you know, partly what I've been trying to cipher through myself and process myself over the last two weeks. Um, and I've mentioned before too that it it's been very, it's been a wild experience to see it happening in my hometown in Minneapolis. Um, and seeing folks react to it differently um, than maybe five years ago. Um, and like trying not to get into my self-righteous, I'm a good person scenario. And um, yeah, just kind of hold all the tension of um, that's happening in Minnesota. It's, it, happen it happened again. There's, it's a sen similar scenario, but there's a lot more response. And then, um, and then what it just continued to remain kind of confusing of what is or isn't happening in terms of the looting and the rioting. And um, yeah, just what my experience was five years ago, uh, participating in Black Lives Matter protests and learning myself and really coming into understanding myself as a white person and being really angry about what I was learning and the cognitive dissonance that I was learning. And so nor like, being able to recognize that in other folks and like have empathy for it is is a wild trip too. like okay I can be here for folks too because I completely understand what this means um so yeah I'm just uh, I'm in a lot of reflection of just how much uh space I have but also what I've said to you and you you checked me on too of like I was feeling tired of all the white folks saying now I'm ready and that's I can't I don't get to do that necessarily. Like I need to be doing what I can to be a, as much of service in this as I can. And that is to be a white person with all the empathy and all the space to be there for folks in this, in the mess of this, because I know how it feels. I know how weird and confusing it can be and that, and that never goes away. And so, um, yeah, I don't think I have clear complete clear answers, but it's just been just trying to stay kind of in observation of it all too. Yeah. But <laughs> it's a lot. It is. I feel myself in this moment um, holding the tension of privilege and oppression within myself. Um, yeah. And so I know that's come up with you and I, and it's come up in opportunities that we've had. Yep where I feel like I am trying to learn more about my privilege as a lighter skinned Latina and what that means yep. um, as a non-Black person of color. And at the same time, I'm being called into spaces where I can teach and, yep. and advocate out of my oppressed identity as a Latina and a Mexican-American. Um, and I think people are confused by that. <laughs> because they're so used to this duality mm. you're privileged or you're oppressed and I'm like I'm both mm. ah. and I need you to understand and see all that um so I think there's this kind of like ah uh, tension inside of me I don't want to get pulled into all white affinity spaces no because that's those have proven to be dangerous and hurtful to me because okay. people have erased my identity um they have um, said things that are very hurtful either about me or other Latinx people and I've had to stomach it um, and then there's microaggressions that happen all the time around my racial identity so I feel kind of like I'm learning how to balance both and, and educate people about that mm -hmm. but it kind of makes me sad when I have to educate mm -hmm. because I'm like can't you just see me like that's mm -hmm. that's a core wound of mine erasure and I think it's a core wound of a lot of Latinx people mm. and I feel like it's something that we need to be able to address and talk about otherwise we're going to be very reactive because we're we're having this wound being triggered and we're not talking about what's triggering it Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to like think back of the last week or so and it's just <laughs> and the 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 very 
real like pressure I'm sensing from a lot of folks too of like I have to say something and I need to and I have you know like just trying to navigate what is right and how how to be in this this moment and with the identities that we hold and so I as a white person if I am not truly understanding myself as that and understanding privilege and oppression and systems and my and and historical context um, then it might feel really scary and uncomfortable to talk to people on on Instagram or even your friends or to navigate you know there there are different calls happening on Facebook right like put this black square up now you know um, only listen to black voices and all these things are wonderful and, and need to happen but if, if folks aren't able to really cipher in and understand where they're at in it it can feel like debilitating and then then nothing happens and so I've seen a lot of folks including myself trying to navigate that in in a pressure cooker yeah what, you, what would you say about that so I, I've been thinking about that too because I I I think I feel it less than I used to because I feel more grounded in my racial identity and um, where my role is in, yeah. in this as a whole in the long haul, right? Like I'm a, yep. I am building a program that's um, educating a lot of people and working with you on providing trainings and all that. Um, I think I am learning more and more in terms of how I should show up around Black Lives Matter and Black issues given that I'm not black so that feels more of the what do I do what do I do um but I think it's I think um the more you're in this and you and I have been in this for a while uh, the more you see the nuances of everything and it's not so much well if you say something then that means this and if you don't say something that means this but um there's a time and place for it all and it really comes down to listening to your own integrity, listening to what you feel moved to do in this moment and what the, the marginalized community who's being affected by the issue is telling you to do and asking you how to show up. But you can't, you can't be like a, a, do a dog, a dog that's getting distracted by this squirrel or that squirrel because one person's gonna be like, shut up now's the time to mute your instagram for seven days the next person's going to be like why are you muting your instagram we need you to speak up more than you ever have yeah. so you got to be able to hold all the perspectives and find your lane and be secure and grounded in that yep. yeah i feel like that's been the message with the numerous folks that i've spoken to that that is the case and 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 just remain in curiosity of what is it that you don't know still like what is, and what is the fear or this like sense of urgency that is coming up what is that showing you um and really and there's only time can you need time to sit sit with it and to really like be able to kind of understand maybe what what is behind it um but yeah like when you as you were describing that that's that's what i was thinking though too is like go do this and then people are like yeah and then I'm, no go do this and they're like yeah <laughs> that's tiring too <laughs> so chaotic. it's super chaotic and that's what i yeah i really pre and i again have been a reflection of you know five years ago versus today i do feel more grounded like i i left a school and i left that school with a very like um, big why and purpose of how I want to continue to be in this work and how I want to influence other white folks and other white adults and um, I do feel like I'm 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 working towards that and I'm doing that and so I can feel um, I, I can see now better where my role is and so I think maybe if folks don't know what their role is right now that is like the ah and I think it's like it's you're probably going to, if you're new to this, you're probably going to feel in that chaos and in that go here, go here, go here, like for a couple years, like yeah, it's not gonna be done. <laughs> you need the groundwork laid of what this all means, how it all connects Sign up for the session. and then all these other layers on top of white supremacy. What is, um, what does cultural appropriation look like? What role does that play? 
what is white saviorism and how does that connect to you posting pictures as a white person with another black person right now people who know these these terms, or kente class <laughs> i was gonna say people who know these terms can spot how this is all playing out and in their head like when uh, Marin and I saw the picture of Nancy Pelosi wearing a kente cloth. It was like an automatic, like, oh, <laughs> awkward, like, meh, 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 you did that wrong, like, you, you fucked up. And we know that because we have layers of what it, we've had layers of conversation of cultural appropriation. We have layers of conversation of white saviorism. And we saw how that picture of her kneeling down with the others, these other people really, um, it's a culmination of everything that is shortcut uh, allyship. That's performative, not, yeah. <clears throat> performative, and and I think the longer that you lean into this, the longer you're long. The I can't even talk. The more yeah. you're going to be able to articulate what is going on behind one photo or one interaction with someone, or like start to trust your instinct. Like, mm, that's a. I'm not totally sure why that's off, but that's off. And now yeah. I need to go figure out why that's off. <laughs> like, hmm, that's not landing right. I'm not totally sure why, but. <laughs> and that's been a big part of my process as an advocate, I guess, and partner with allies. Um, the amount of times white people have come to me and been like, so I had this interaction. And then the other person who is a person of color they look kind of confused or mad and they talk it through with me and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see what's going on, but the way I coach uh, white allies is what do you think is going on? What happened? And then we can get to, oh, wait a minute. I, I discounted their idea before even listening and whatever is playing out. Right. And I guess the other part too is if you are someone who finds themselves in a scenario like Nancy or like Jacob Frey, the Minneapolis, like, I think that's part of it too, right? You're going to make mistakes and that that's just inevitable. And there's, there's really no way around it. And so if that's another message, I feel like I keep saying to folks and that keeps coming back of, and where we feel comfortable with our identities to speak on these is we, cause we can speak on the mistakes that we've made and, and, and have, how we've learned from that. And, you know, maybe that's another um, next week or something, but like made some really, <laughs> some major mistakes where like back now I'm like, wow, sense of urgency, perfection. Like there's just so many things that I got clouded and I wanted to do it right. And I just went in and did it. And now I can see like, if I had slowed down, if I had asked for help, like there are different ways that that could have gone. And so, it's, it's, it's hard work to be in constant reflection around and that potential of harming and making mistakes. Like, it, cause I'm someone who hates to make mistakes. A lot of people do, I hear that a lot. I just don't want to, but yeah, it is what it is. You make mistakes in other areas of your life. If there you're we a go. parent out there, if you're a parent out there, imagine if someone's like, well, uh, you can't be, like you can't have your kids unless you're willing, unless you don't make mistakes. Like it's laughable. Like you're going to make them every day and that's how you learn and grow and become better parents. Um, same with any kind of relationship, being a good sibling, being a good partner, whatever it is. And so that's how I would want people to start viewing this. Mm. Allyship and advocacy is just another branch of relationship. Yes. And it's possible that you can have one like ours, Marin and I. Yeah we have a strong friendship we have yeah. we're building trust together and that's helping us do really amazing work and neither of us i i think knew we were going to end up in this line of inclusion and equity work we kind of just started happening upon it and and yeah. found building bridges and um another thing i was going to say too around the mistakes pieces it could look really different when you're talking about the white ally journey of mistakes yeah. and uh, uh, BIPOC journey of mistakes. For me, it's um, it's involved a lot of mistakes around, I've, I, there also was a sense of urgency, but kind of like an over eagerness 
to get out there and like fight for my people and say things uh, abruptly and in leading out of my anger at times it it resulted in punishment it resulted in disciplinary actions it resulted in ways that were ineffective so i've learned to be more strategic about when and how i bring up um issues that i feel like need to be addressed around racial equity yeah um and then also there's such a wealth of wisdom inside of me from the life that i've lived as someone who is not white that becomes more and more clear the more words i get mm. So if you're watching this and you identify as black, indigenous, or a person of color, and you're like, well, I don't have all the words, or I don't know how to do this, and I also don't want to make mistakes, like, you don't even know how much you already know. Mm. You have the scars, you have the wounds to prove it, whether or not you're fully aware of it, and that's going to become more clear over time, and you're going to be, you're going to have these flashbacks of like, wait a minute, we did have that conversation at work about professional dress attire. And someone commented on the fact that I was wearing hoops. Someone commented on the fact and my sister's work that I was coming to work unprofessional because my hair was wet when it was my hairspray. Hmm. And it's like these little microaggressions start to become more clear over time. And again, that like what you thought was happening is, is happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that feeling of validation, oof, mm -hmm. I can't just, there's not much that compares to that when you're, especially that's why we're doing affinity spaces mm -hmm. for a groundwork session, because the kind of, the kind of aha moments I've seen happen in these BIPOC POC affinity spaces have been long lasting transformative moments of wait, you too? someone has touched your hair too like it's it's really necessary to the whole process and i'm sure you could speak to that on the white space it looks different but how is that part of it what role does affinity space play um it it plays for a place for all the emotions to come out and come out in a in a place that can where it is appropriate and can be held um for me, it's encouraging folks to um, to feel what they're feeling. I mean, anger, sadness, like that's something that white folks we need to tap into more. That it, that you are a human being, um, you know, impacted by this as well, and you should be impacted by the murder of of folks right in front of us on video. Um, that should do something to you. Um, there's other just ways to practice. To me, it's building a muscle. White folks, we need to grow up our bodies, our nervous systems and build our muscles um, to talk about it and to, um, to be able to essentially tell on ourselves and, and to hold space for other folks in whatever, wherever they're at. Um, to me, it, it can be really, it can feel not that it's real, but it could feel isolating if you're someone new into this and don't have other folks who have maybe the language or the context that you do. So it's it's another sense of uh, affirmation and place to feel like, you know, like you said, any sort of growth that you need, you need we need community. And um, to me, more and more, I'm hearing the call, especially from Risa Menekin, who some of you know is um, someone, his book, My Grandmother's Hands is, incredible and he talks a lot around how white folks even just we need to build culture around this right like the kkk have culture and that 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 brings them together in a sense of why they do what they do and how do how do white folks counter that and create a new culture around like let's be honest let's be real let's be vulnerable let's let's um be in humility and curiosity and i think again that's to me what we do at building bridges is I'm able to build my communication skills. I'm able to look in and how I interact and react to the world. And therefore that only helps me feel more authentic and in community and uh, with other folks. Like I feel like I can really be in the mess of what it is to be human. Yeah, that's good. Oh, it's 117. Ah! We're at time. So we should probably do a check out. Mm. 
Let's do what's the weather like in your world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what's the weather like in your world, Marin? Uh, what is the weather like? I'm feeling sluggish still. It's a cloudy day. It's a cloudy day, but the sun comes out every once in a while. Sometimes like Colorado cloudy where like there's one cloud that rains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> For me, it's a sunny day. Um, yeah, yeah. Sunny day, not completely. Well, there's some wind, so it's mm -hmm. like you're you're one of those days where you're like it's like a Chicago windy kind of day where <laughs> you're like it's such a great day to be out. And you get dirt <laughs> in your face, and you're like, oh, okay, I think I'm going back inside. That's how it feels to me. <laughs> <laughs> the facade of it's great, and then it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you folks. Uh, yes. Next Wednesday at 1230. Whoop whoop.